Okay, thanks everyone for joining us in the room um, and also online. Um, we're going to be here for about half an hour having an informal discussion um, on the theme of can we live with monopolies. Um, we're going to have a chat here for about 20 minutes and then we'll open it up to any questions from the floor. Um, I'm here with Phil Jennings, who's General Secretary of UNI Global Union and he looks after, um, he represents workers in the services sector. Um, also here with David Alter, who's Ford Professor of Economics at MIT. Um, so just very briefly, we are in the age of big tech. Um, everyone knows it, it's a time of huge global opportunities for a relatively small handful of firms, a lot of them based in Silicon Valley. Um, there are big concentrations of power and opportunity, and with that comes some quite thorny, complicated questions. I think it's an area where definitions are difficult and very important. Um, so the first question is for David. As an economist, what is a monopoly? Good. Well, monopoly technically means a single seller of a product. But I think what we're really talking about is market power. Uh, market power means uh, firms have some ability to set prices. So it's, they don't face perfect competition. They, they can choose to sell their product for a higher price and sell slightly fewer. Uh, or lower the price and sell more. So monopolies have an, or firms with market power have an incentive to reduce output to raise prices. And market power can also be, I'm sure Phil will talk about this, on the labor market side. Mm -hmm. Firms may control so many of the workers in a given occupation that they don't face mu much competition from other employers. And I think we should be at least as concerned about what's called monopsony or market power in the labor market as we should be about market power in the product market. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It will definitely be returning to the idea of how you define a monopoly and what the precedents are in history. Um, but turning to Phil, you can see monopoly is bad news for economies because they distort the market. But what about normal people? Why are monopolies bad news for the people that you represent around the world? How do they impact their lives? Well, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. What can I say? Monopoly is back. We have more wealth, concentration of wealth, in not just in the high-tech sector, but throughout the economy, this is no accident. We have let this happen. In the realm of big tech, you're all aware of the figures that 46% of online sales uh, are attributed to Google, 90% of the global search activity, uh, sorry, to Amazon, 90% plus of all the search activity is Google. And with Facebook, we're heading towards a Facebook planet of 3 billion people online. We should also look at retail. We should look at the finance sector. Remember 10 years ago when we were talking about the financial crisis, that banks were too big to fail? We saw concentration of financial power. They weren't too big to fail, and they, and they failed us. I think our approach on this, when working people look at this, we look back in time, and we have to maybe look back to that time of when the plutocrats first made their apparition at the time of the Industrial Revolution. I found a quote which might help. John Sherman, as the Sherman Antitrust Act said, if we will not endure a king as political power, we should not endure a king over the production, transportation, and sale of any necessities of life. Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations said something similar. Why does this particular uh, form of monopoly as we see it worry us? We have to think of the digital world in terms of digital conglomerates. We have a time of digital feudalism. This means the power that they have is enormous and has ripples and implications in all ways, in terms of the price that people pay for a product, in terms of wages, in terms of inequality, and in terms of power. And therefore, they are concerns which, which we have dealt with in the past. But what is new about this, in this new age of digital conglomeration, it is now clear that these tools not only can direct us in terms of the products that we buy, but they begin to have an impact on the way that we think, on the way that we respond, the way that we receive and interpret the news, and all of a sudden you see an all-embracing monopolistic power, if you like, which goes beyond the material into the the non-material of world in terms of our behavior and in terms of our attitude. Now, I can give you the nuts and bolts of what it means to us when Walmart comes to town. 
When Walmart comes to town, local competition is hammered. It has a depressing impact on competition, squeezes out the small and medium-sized enterprises, and has a major impact on the price of labor as well. We have seen in Silicon Valley the use of this power uh, when their cartel on engineering salaries was bust some time ago, which apparently cost millions. The figures are clear. It cost hundreds of millions in terms of, of lost earnings. So what can I say? From where I am, I'm not a lawyer. I am not a, a competition expert. But we are worried about the new power that we have. We must talk in terms of digital capitalism, digital conglomerates, a kind of digital feudalism which goes beyond the material into how we interact as humans, how we, how we form opinions, how we engage with the political process, and our sense is this has gone too far. Has it gone too far? How much power is too much power? First of all, that was a terrific speech, so hats <laughs> off. And I, I, I don't want to detract from it at all. Uh, it's hard, so let me say, it, it, I think it's worth asking where, where this is coming from. Right. Uh, when we say, is it going too far? Well, how did we get here? Uh, and um, I think it, uh, it, it's plausible that a lot of the growth of market power that we have seen recently, and I agree that we see a lot of growth of market power, uh, is not because of abuses or anti-competitive behavior per se. That doesn't mean it has all good consequences. But a lot of it has to do with the changing nature of competition. Uh, we are increasingly in an era of what, what uh, some of my uh, fellow economists and I call uh, called winner-take-most markets, markets where small competitive advantages can mean enormous differences in market share. In, in a world where there's, you know, search frictions are high, information is low, lots of firms of different quality and price can coexist. In a sort of an Amazon online search world where everybody goes relentlessly for the lowest price, it's actually uh, feasible for the company that has the best logistics system to uh, get, gather huge amounts of market share. In products like uh, search or in social media, there's also uh, what we call network externalities that people want to be on Facebook because other people want to be on Facebook and other people are there because of that. And so these things may be growing organically as a result of the change in the nature of competition. That doesn't mean that that's a good thing or just because it happened naturally, you know, we shouldn't worry about it. I'm not, that's not my argument. But I think we need to understand where it's coming from. Has it gone too far? Okay, let me, let me turn it back to you. I'm just interested, just for a yeah. moment, in what you were saying, saying about sort of historical precedents. Are what we, we see, is what we're seeing now totally unprecedented? This convergence of data in the internet and technology, or if we look back at previous industrial revolutions, have we seen it all before? Are there lessons from well, the there's past? There's lessons, and, and Phil alluded to this. Uh, during the kind of Gilded Age, we did have these monopolies in the railroads and oil, and uh, we broke them up. Uh, and, uh, and they were certainly subject to abuse. Uh, and we, our current regulatory framework isn't very well set up for dealing with the so-called digital monopolies because it's not obvious they're abusing their market power at present. They may very well, uh, but they do have a lot of power. And um, so our, our regulatory structure may not be set up to recognize the challenges that they pose. I mean, the US has historically stepped in, uh, in the case of AT&T, broke up AT&T. It, it gave Microsoft, Microsoft a hard time for a while. I'm not clear if that uh, had a big effect, but Microsoft is certainly not the competitor it used to be. One thing to bear in mind is sometimes companies that appear indomitable uh, actually fade pretty fast. So mm -hmm. IBM, people used to talk about IBM, then they talked about Microsoft. Uh, and now these companies are not where they once were. Walmart was considered indomitable 15 years ago. Now it faces enormous competition from Amazon. Or do you remember Friendster, Friendster or uh, MySpace, right, uh, kind of sucked up? I would guess that Facebook will be almost non-existent 20 years from now. Probably I'm wrong about that. Now you have it on record. But I know I don't use it. I think that's the beginning of the trend. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think this question of abuse is, is important. And I think the regulatory authorities, there's a kind of a ripple around the world in regulation that things seem to have gone too far. Mm -hmm. And they're certainly attracting the attention of regulators uh, as to what the economic and competitive impacts are and whether competition is really taking place, as they say, on the merits. In terms of the abuses that we've seen, it's not just by chance that Google was fined 2.9 billion euros by the European Commission. And it wasn't just by chance that Apple was fined something approaching $13 billion because of their tax evasion policies. 
Now, I would say that is an abuse of market power. It's a lack of ethical principles in the operation of the, of the organization. And it's a sign that when you have this much power, the, the, the latency for abuse is a, is a real one. And FDR, he said, the Great Depression was caused by the economic tyranny of monopolization. Now, I, I like this flow of words. <laughs> and therefore, then, then perhaps we've been given these large, the big three, a, a bit of a free pass in terms of what, what are the ramifications of the things that they do. And I, and I feel that there's this idea that there's this natural, organic kind of growth to the organization, they are growing by acquisition. They're buying one company a week, sometimes four companies a week. And therefore, because they have the money and the financial power to do it. The other side of this is one of the great fractures that this World Economic Forum is talking about is the fracture in inequality of power, inequality of wealth, and inequality of income distribution. When you have the financial wealth funneling up to a small community of people, then this will aggravate the fractures and make it more difficult to deal with the income and wealth distribution problems that we have. Let me, let me uh, focus on the, the part of what you said that I agree with, uh, which is the, um, the labor market side. I, I'm very con I share your concern that the kind of the concentration, I'm not so worried about concentration in search, frankly, but I am worried about concentration in labor markets where workers don't face effective outside competition for their labor. And you can see that. You don't have to look to Google. Uh, in the United States, fast food franchisees have non-compete agreements with one another where they won't hire workers who worked at the McDonald's down the block. Now, mm -hmm. McDonald's has actually subsequently changed its policy yeah. now that it's been exposed. But yeah. that notion of labor tying, when you don't have yeah. effective competition for workers, and much more, I mean, you mentioned the sort of collusion in Silicon Valley. That's an abuse. But, uh, I'm much more concerned about abuse of minimum wage workers or people who really have uh, trouble uh, uh, fending for themselves in the labor market. So that idea that workers have very few options mm -hmm. is even more consequential, in my view, than that consumers have few options in these areas. I think in many cases, these, you know, what Google has done, what Amazon has done, with there's a lot of great free services. They've lowered prices. They've made life more convenient. However, uh, to the degree that they, uh, this has the effect of you know, stores shut down, they don't compete for workers, mm -hmm. uh, tech engineers uh, have few options if they aren't mm -hmm. hired for Google. That's, a, that's the side of it that I'm, I'm particularly The concerned. bottom line for us in the world of labor as well is the ability for us to organize these workers, mm -hmm. to negotiate for these workers, and try to give them a decent contract. <coughs> There's been a wave of industrial action in Amazon for the people working in their so-called fulfillment centers. <laughs> we've had issues. When you say so-called, are you yeah, suggesting yeah, they're that's, unfulfilling? Yeah, so-called, so-called. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, it, and, and the reality is that Amazon and their top leadership are implacably opposed to the union organization of their members. And therefore, the workers are taking their destiny into their own hands. Now, we have some works councils emerging, but before Christmas, there were a wave of industrial action because Amazon will not respect the basic human rights of their workers to organize. Now, in Facebook, we had similar issues years past, but now we begin to see uh, a change in their line where they will work with the local labor movement. A sign of, of uh, a non-abusive power would be an engagement with the labor movement to get into a serious conversation about the human rights of workers, the trade union rights of workers, and the wages that they are paid. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. <laughs> I think we're on the same, same side of the page here on the labor market side. Our, our diagnosis of the extent of abuse may differ, but the concern mm -hmm. is shared. The concerns are shared. What can we actually do to prevent abuses, whether they're of workers or of markets? We live in a borderless online age. The models that we used to apply are just very difficult I here. Think, what practically, what can be done? How do you regulate the big tech companies? I think there are questions to be asked. That are global. About, the questions really are to be asked how adequate is the current regulatory framework to deal with this new uh, concentration, this massing of, of economic power. And I think there's a number of questions or a number of approaches. Do you stop, how do you stop the monopoly before it happens, i.e. monopoly which is made by acquisition? We've seen in each of the cases, the big three, Google, Facebook, and Amazon, um, a growth of market uh, uh, power through, through Acquisition. So do you stop this before it happens? Another one is, do you build structural barriers to monopoly in certain industries? So to, we had the Glass-Eagle Act, the culmination of which was a, a massive financial crisis 30 years down the track. 
what, is, what, what could be done in terms of building structural barriers. And in the world of online ad companies, you know, you, 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 you own the channel and you use that channel to compete against the people using the channel. And then do you split up or neutralize the power of corporations that have the ability to dominate and to control entire realms of a commerce? And so there are, I think there are things that can be done that, that, that regulators have in their locker to do something about this. But at the end of the day, the platforms, these organizations, have to take responsibility for what they do. They try to wash their hands of responsibility in terms of media and fake news and all the rest of it. And when two-thirds of the population have access to news through the social media, this raises questions about our democracies as well. And I hope that this will lead to new reflections about what, the, about what this means to have such concentration of power and that can have such a manipulative power on the way people think and act. At the last, at the last I would say, pay your taxes and also respect the human rights of people. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't, you don't, you shouldn't be granted the social license to operate. Mm -hmm. um, David, most countries have laws to prevent monopolies. What's going wrong? Is something going wrong? No, I, I, do, I don't think primarily this is a regulatory fail, failure. Many of these are n new developments. And I, and, I, and I also don't think the abuse of, of these so-called monopolies on the market, on the consumer-facing side is that extreme. I'm much more concerned we feel on the worker side and the ability to negotiate competitive contracts for workers and make sure the gains are shared. I think some countries do that much better than others. I think countries have much some countries have much more encompassing regulatory frameworks for worker protection and better bargaining between and representation of labor <laughs> in management and on corporate boards. I think that in the long run that model will work better. I think the US model where workers are not considered a stakeholder, just shareholders are considered a stakeholder, uh, has created a level of inequality and social disaffection that has led to kind of political upheaval, uh, mm -hmm. which I do not think is necessarily in the interest of, uh, of the uh, money corporations. Perhaps mm -hmm. it is, perhaps it isn't, we'll, we'll see. So I, I think that is the greater concern. I don't think the fact that we're living in a globalized world means we don't have national self-determination on those matters. Countries can decide. What are their basic social protections? What are the minimum wages? What are the benefits that are guaranteed? What type of bargaining rights? So I don't think that we have to cede that uh, to the notion that we no longer, that's, that, that, that's no longer within our borders. I don't mm -hmm. think that's, uh, I think we should give ourselves credit and opportunity. And what about from both of you, what about the bright side of these platforms? In some ways, bigger can be better. They make the world smaller. They empower people in many ways. They make life easier, more efficient. They make products no cheaper. Question. The CEO of Google has said that he sees AI as a big stride for humanity akin to electricity or fire. It could be the leap forward that helps us to tackle climate change or find cures for cancer. There's a lot of utopianism out there. How do we get the balance right between... So, as, as I emphasized earlier, we've gotten lots of benefits right, from these platforms. You know, Amazon has made the world a cheaper place. Convenient, Google has made it more convenient, and Facebook has made it more social. Uh, the, um, <laughs> whether, uh, in the long run, AI will clearly, you know, enhance productivity. The challenge is one of distribution, mm -hmm. not of growth. We are going to get wealthier. The question is whether we turn that into shared prosperity mm -hmm. or pure plutocracy. That is an institutional choice. It's not determined fundamentally by markets or by technologies. It's f determined by societies. We can look around and see equally countries with similar material resources, uh, you, uh, and very different outcomes. Compare Nor Norway and Saudi Arabia, right? Two oil-rich nations, right? One of which is a, a, a very a, a mobile, satisfied place, economically mobile, lots of public investment, high rates of labor force participation, extremely democratic. Another of which is an absolute monarchy, uh, and you know does have high standards of living, but thwarts many other human strivings. The difference between them is not their technologies, not the market; it's their institutions. So these are institutional choices, and we. We sell ourselves short and foreclose opportunities by thinking we don't have control over this. We get to decide. Mm -hmm. Phil, how concerned are you about the impact of trends like automation and the rise of AI on well, workers? Well, first of all, I think it, 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 there's a concern about what this means for the labor market in the, in, the, in the bigger picture. We have three billion people in the world's labor market. Half of them are, are already in what we call vulnerable work. One, one in three of them is surviving on just a couple of bucks a day. Uh, when we look at the, uh, 
inequality in terms of wealth and income. Frankly, the share of the wealth produced which goes to the working population is in very rapid decline. And in fact, we, we are seeing levels of inequality in the distribution of, of income that we have not seen since Woodrow Wilson and uh, John Sherman and others were talking about the power of the plutocrats. And we are worried that when you have three companies which amass this wealth and power, that this can only aggravate the, the, the inequality equation. It was something that Thomas Piketty missed about the, how the structure of economic power has an impact on inequality. And we're also asking the question about what is the, the price to pay. So I recently watched the, uh, the Black Mirror Netflix series. And I'm not sure how many of you in the room have seen the Black Mirror mm. Netflix series. But it all this dystopian vision of artificial intelligence is actually coming true before our eyes. And when you look at the... The, the, the evolution of artificial intelligence and the absence of any form of proper regulation or convention. We're worried about the transparency of these things. We're concerned about the, the lack of ethical guidelines. We, we would like to see an ethical black box. We would like to insist that humans have some control, that there is some human mediation here. We're in a new realm of human experience. And that's why I, I draw attention to this Business. This is not about fixing the price of a product or fixing the price of labor. This is a massive, also one can say, manipulation of how we think, how we perceive, how we see, how we vote, how we interpret on a, on a scale which we, have, which we have never seen. Now, I know it sounds like a potential script for Charlie Brooker in the Black Mirror. <laughs> I know. But at the end of the day, you can see these things coming alive. And you will see, I think, what we, we will have a reaction and that there will be this demand for humans in control, for ethical black boxes, and then for us as a community to say, what kind of world do we want to see here? Mm. And is that the world, this dystopian world, mm. where we have three companies who, uh, who have all the authority and the power? That's not the world that we would like to see. Mm. Predictions of the future are notoriously difficult, and I think Charlie Brook has got the right idea with fictionalising it. Um, however, I'm going to be a little harsher on our panellists. Do you think we're at a turning point where, going, where we're going to ask these big questions, get the framework right, and move forward in the right direction? Or do you think that we're going to see the kind of crisis that you've been speaking of from history? Are you I, no, I, I'm not nearly as pessimistic as well. Uh, I, I think that we have both opportunities and challenges. They always come hand in hand. Uh, the fast, fact is these technologies open vistas of possibility, of advances in science, but also of shared prosperity. In fact, you think of the way mobile technology has been so critical to the developing world, allowing for uh, communication, for agriculture, for prices, for competition. Um, I think there are real risks and real concerns, but it always takes us time to catch up with the challenges uh, that we create for ourselves through these innovations. Um, we could have had a similarly dystopian view in the, at the dawn of a nuclear age. Uh, we could have said the same about AT&T and IBM uh, and their cartelization of the planet and so on. These are real challenges, but I, I don't think uh, we're incapable of overcoming them. And we shouldn't look at them purely from the perspective of they're all negative. It's like, this is not global warming, something we'd rather have but just have to deal with. We want these advances. We want these technologies. They're going to improve our productivity, allow us uh, ho hopefully to share resources better and certainly make our lives more interesting. We just need to figure out how to make sure that that opportunity is not squandered. And it's quite possible to squander it. It won't take care of itself, but we shouldn't, it's not a foregoing conclusion that we'll blow it. <laughs> Got one I last think, question I, for I, I, I Phil on that note point. before we open it up to questions uh, on the floor. Can I just say, do I feel that this is a turning point in the, in the evolution of the capitalist system? Yes a further evolution in terms of the digital change before us, most definitely. According to the uh, uh, atomic scientists, the nuclear clock is at two minutes to midnight. Whereas before, whereas a decade ago, it was nine minutes to midnight. For us, it feels like two minutes to midnight. So I do feel it's a turning point. And what I would say is if we continue as business as usual, then, then, we, then the outcomes make us feel very skeptical. However, if we can turn the ax towards a policy of more inclusive growth, of a new sense of purpose for business, I liked that Larry Fink the other day turned around and said, 
We're going to invest in businesses which have a sense of purpose, <coughs> a social purpose in, in all its dimensions. The forum is trying hard in their risk report to show, and the, the uh, report they've done on inclusive growth and what does it take. Then that makes me more optimistic. In terms of the bigger picture, the statistics would indicate that we're going through a massive labor market, ma market transformation. Occupations and tasks will change. My question is, how prepared are we? How prepared are we to accompany people through this transformation? The market cannot solve this. It needs new values, a new sense of community, a new sense of responsibility to ensure that people are prepared. And our problem is that we're not taking those measures now to ensure that somewhere over the rainbow, happy ending. Thank you, Phil. So from the doomsday clock um, and black mirror to a new era of purpose and responsibility, um, plenty of food for thought here, and I'd like to open it up for any questions. Yes. Hi, my name is Linda. I'm from the Boston Globe. Um, you mentioned there was a comment about connecting, uh, comparing AI to electricity. Is there any chance that these um, Google and these companies will be regulated like the utilities that they are becoming? Uh, there's a chance. I mean, there's certainly precedent to view them as kind of common carriers, right? That's the framework we've used for. That was the framework we used to regulate uh, telephony as well as uh, mail delivery. Um, it's possible. I, don't, I doubt there's much regulatory appetite for that. Um, but it would be feasible to say, you could argue that Amazon is a common carrier, right? They're the platform on which many all other firms will compete for retail business and Google for advertisement and so on. So it would be feasible. Uh, I think it's very unlikely to occur. And given that, uh, one hopes that there will be other forms of organic competition uh, that will uh, actually you know, undermine or at least reduce their market power. Well, you get, even if a company gains market power based on excellence, once it's there, it has uh, every incentive to uh, abuse that power, to maintain its control, and also often becomes quite mediocre, uh, which is we've seen with many monopolies. They start off great, eventually they make uh, overpriced, cut, uh, low quality products uh, that we are forced to buy regardless. So hopefully the answer will be through better competition, because I doubt it will come through common carrier regulation. I think, I think the regulatory authorities are slowly waking up to this. There seems to be pressures building uh, practically in, in many uh, corridors of power to raise questions about what, about what this means. And it will raise questions about the common good. It will raise questions about the digital commons. And at the end of the day, it might lead to a new reflection about what data means. Because we have a form of data feudalism. And I think people will wake up to the fact that the, the new resource, the new raw material, is them, their behavior. Uh, and, and the way that they go about their lives becomes the treasure that the feudal digital lords currently have without question. So therefore, I, there may well be another angle on this, looking at them as public utilities. They are public utilities with a public responsibility, does that mean that you put new constraints on their behavior, that they have to act always in the public good? They claim that they would already, but we would, uh, well, we is, would question that. This is that. what China has done with all of these, right? They've taken over search. They've taken over social media. They've taken over price comparison. Uh, I'm not so excited about that idea. Okay. Thank uh, you. I would we rather have them uh, not be so under central government control. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm just aware that the clock is yeah. ticking and in case there are any more questions out there. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm wondering about Professor Otter's stance on how to regulate them. If um, uh, the, uh, the proposed measures aren't uh, what you foresee or, or see as likely, what, what would you propose to uh, mitigate the risks of these superstar firms? Sure. So that's a hard question, and the answer is going to differ by sector, right? So in advertising, you can see, you know, you know, lots of platforms have a, 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 an incentive to abuse their privilege to place their ads first, right? Mm -hmm. If you're Amazon, you have an ability, you have an incentive to undermine your the companies that are selling on your platform. So one can imagine moving in that direction. I don't have a more well thought out answer. Uh, but I, I, think it, I think it's a challenging one, but it's not insurmountable. Okay. We have one more minute. Any quick questions? This gentleman has his hand up here. Oh. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Paulo Kumo. Just uh, 
two very quick questions. I'll make them in all, all in 50 seconds. One is, uh, I wonder why those companies sometimes don't even want to be here. Do they feel like they don't need to be here for them to run anything? And what does that mean for us if they don't even want to be, uh, to be anywhere where they can hear another opinion? And then the, sec the second question is, we are working on the assumption that there are some people called regulators. But if you look at what has happened over the last five or so years, is that business interests and government interests have might. And um, they, are, they, are, they, are, they almost act as one. Sure, if I, mean, I the could, question, this if I could okay. briefly yeah. handle oh, the, of course, the of first course. question. Um, rest assured, this is a topic that's being discussed this morning. I was following a session on the new digital economy with a number of tech CEOs, and you may be surprised to find that some of them sounded remarkably like you. One of them yeah. made the point that there is no business model as yet to reward people for their data. In the yeah. old day, you'd pay people if you discovered oil on their land, and there's no yeah. way to monetize yeah at the moment. I anyway, would, there are, please check out say, the program. I would be very happy if they paid their people already for the work that they do. If you're working <laughs> in an Amazon fulfillment center, you're not getting a fair deal. If you're working as on Amazon Turk, your average per day is around two bucks. You can't make a living mm. from this. Mm. And therefore, I would say to Bezos and his crew, rethink your business model. Um, when other uh, financial players are saying a, a sense of purpose to your business, to give broader meaning to your business, and to respect the human rights of people, I would say to Amazon in particular, you have to change your ways and respect the people that make you, Mr. Bezos, one of the wealthiest players in the world. Would you like to respond to the gentleman's second question? I, well, the, the, yes, and this is the question you, this, you had also shared out about, you know, why do I think regulators won't do this? Well, actually, res, res, to your question, if you look at the United States, we are in the process of dismantling regulation at a phenomenal rate. We, can, we don't even agree anymore that, uh, you know, when people give financial advice, they should give honest advice. That apparently was too much of a stretch for uh, our regulators. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I just don't see the, the movement in that direction. It's not that it's infeasible. It, uh, it just, you know, that, that's not where the social contract seems to be heading. Um, uh, so I, I think it's a real concern. I, I think this, and this is the, the, you know, massive concentration of wealth tends to lead to massive concentration of political power. We kind of have, we tend to have a one dollar, one vote system. Uh, and, uh, and that's a real concern. I would say that a lot of the policies that are adopted, certainly in the United States, are very distortionary and are, you know, subsidizing capital at the expense of labor uh, in an era when capital is already cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, and labor is facing uh, challenges just to maintain a, a, a share, an, a, 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 a constant share of national income. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Okay. Thanks for your questions. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thanks, you 2 million Facebook.